Pleasure being here. Uh, so, well, really, there are three parts to the story, and this, uh, well, I think it's a recurrent theme recently in physics that, uh, surprisingly, gravity and, and gauge theories turn to, out to be related more closely than I would have thought. Uh, and uh, well, we're exploring the subject uh, with uh, actually what I will talk about today mostly. It's it's, it's gauge series and it's made mo mo mostly based on the work with Raphael Flauger and Viktor Gabrenka. Raphael, by now uh, officially famous for discovering that there is much more dust in our galaxies than bicycle folks used to think. And Victor is a graduate student and he's applying this year for jobs and I think he's brilliant. So if you have a postdoc position, you should hire him. Uh, and well, this was two topics covered uh, yesterday. Uh, my colloquium, so today I focus really on the QCD part of the story. Uh, and let me start with just a few remarks. Uh, basically, well, I want to ask why would one care about QCD? And if you asked me this question three years ago, uh, I would give you many reasons why one should not care. And the list was roughly its following. So we completely know the theory. So we know the Lagrangian, there will be no surprises there. So it's very different from doing beyond the standard model physics, but the most fun is that, well, you don't know the Lagrangian, something really new may come, come up. So this is known theory. Uh, and also, well, it's known for a long time, and kind of all easy, straightforward results are already obtained. So there is still hard work to be done, but, well, it's really hard. And furthermore, you, you're not expecting to make some like, breaks or some big, big qualitative progress there. Uh, so, well, now I think somewhat differently. So one reason to care is we know the theory, and actually that's very rare. So not for many uh, quantum field theories we have uh, fully non-perturbative definition, at least in the physicist sense. So we, we can take the theory, put it on a computer, and calculate everything. Uh, and well, there are not many theories like that. And also, this is highly non-trivial theory with highly non-trivial dynamics, uh, and it's relevant for nature. Furthermore, there is a roughly 50 years old surprise, which is still there and not quite understood yet. And uh, what I mean by that, that well, when Itzana wrote his amplitude by staring at hadron scattering data, uh, so uh, and it's not a coincidence because there is a, reason, a real regime when QCD uh, described by by strings. Uh, and so furthermore, well, I try to convince you in my talk. So if one focuses on that part of QCD, which is uh, not that much explored, uh, uh, then, uh, well, there are actually relatively straightforward qualitatively new results which, which, you, you, which you may figure obtain. So there is actually a chance to uh, learn something qualitatively new. Well, there's extra benefit because of these relations between gauge theory and gravity, so one can be even more ambitious and think, well, at least if you learn something new about string theory this way, you learn some, there is a chance you learn something about gravity. Uh, so, yeah, this slide man, means to illustrate that QCD is a theory of strings. So, it's definitely a regime of QCD where it's best described by uh, strings rather than a point like particles. So, this is just a Romanian rigid trajectory. Uh, and, uh, it's beautifully linearly growing rigid trajectory showing these particles are just excitations of a string like object. And this is lattice simulation showing the uh, field lines. In the presence of three quarks, so that's what it would be a proton. Uh, so there are strings there, there are flat, flat fields. Uh, and basically, well, the question is what can we say about this string theory? So definitely, we know much more field theory and string theory than people knew in the uh, late, late 60s. And still, we, I think it's fair to say we don't know that much about that, that string theory. Uh, although, I should say, well, for the remarkable recent progress. Uh, recently uh, happening right now from top-down perspective, namely uh, a cousin of uh, QCD. So when I talk about QCD here, I really mean non-supersymmetric n equals 3 uh, QCD. Uh, uh, but uh, the supersymmetric cousin of this theory, for supersymmetric cousin of this theory, uh, the underlying dynamics of string was shown to be integrable. And I think, well, it's a very ex exciting, so in particular that's allowed to obtain the exact solution for the spectrum of operators of that theory. And the next natural step would be calculate OP coefficients, meaning calculate scattering amplitudes for that string theory. Uh, 
Well, and yet another s the next step, of course, is that, uh, well, this theory is not confining, so there are no actual flux tubes in this theory. So these strings which were found to be integrable here, well, they're somewhat, well, they live in the dual ideas space, so it's, it's, it's not those flux tubes which I've shown there, so the next step would be uh, to identify uh, and answer the question, is there really a confining theory uh, where in a large M limit has integrable dynamics on its wall sheet, uh, and, well, I, I think, well, given that this string turned out to be integrable, I think there are reasons to expect that the answer to this question yes, and I won't be surprised if examples of such theories will be found within the next 10 years or so. Uh, but, well, that's one motivation to, for, to think about this kind of question now, but this won't be approach which I will follow. So this, this talk follows bottom-up approach, or effective field theory approach, which may be summarized, well, uh, roughly saying, if you have a theory where you see strange string-like object, well, that means you can, in that regime, there should be a way to describe a theory as a perturbation theory around, around the string. Uh, so that's, I think that's philosophy of effective field theory. So, uh, and that's what I, I will be uh, following, fo focusing on, on here. Uh, and I will talk a lot about data. So by data, I will... So, so, Sorry, there are experimentalists in the room. By data, I mean here. By data, I mean here computer data. So it's not. It, it won't be real world QCD. It will be pure dual dynamics. So, uh, and well, the reason is that it's easier to study. If you're interested in dynamics of strings, it's easier to study them in pure glue theory because string, string does, can, cannot break there. Uh, there is no uh, quark anti quark pair, pair production. So. Uh, that's a natural theory to start with. Still, it will be n equals 3 non supersymmetric glue dynamics. So it's very close to, to the theory uh, we, we care about for nature. Uh, and so let me tell you what people measure. So well, people calculate the path integral of this theory, of part the partition function for the theory on, on the computer. Uh, and what they measure, uh, so they uh, uh, take benefit of the fact that they're on the computer. On the computer, of course, all dimensions are compact. Uh, well, usually you're trying to make them as large as possible because you want to take infinite limit, but here you're taking benefit of the fact that all dimensions are, 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 are compact dimensions. So then it's useful to think about uh, one dimension being more compact than the other, meaning one, one circle to be somewhat smaller, and it's useful to think about this as a spatial surface. Of course, on computer everything is Euclidean, so it's Euclidean theory, so people always think about this compact dimension as temperature for, for the purpose of, of this talk is better to think about it as a really compact uh, spatial dimension and then what you can do you can calculate a two-point function of uh, operators like, like this when you form a uh, Wilson line or Podakov loop which wraps around uh, this, this compact dimension uh, so you look at the uh, correlators of, of these operators uh, and then, well, you do the same thing as you do when you do references global spectrum measurement. <laughs> so you look at the uh, large time asymptotics of this uh, two-point function, and from this uh, two-point function, from this large time asymptotics, you deduce the energy which uh, of states which uh, uh, contribute to this correlator. Uh, but what's important that uh, contribution, for topological reasons, contributions uh, to this two-point function it only comes from states which are created by loops which are uh, uh, winding around this, this circle. So a technical way to say it that is in the presence of compact dimension, uh, the QCD acquires new global symmetry, because you may, can make a gauge transformation which characterized by function which is not periodic, but it's periodic with a twisted boundary condition when you act uh, by the element from the center of the gauge group as you go, go around the circle. So it's not an honest... Uh, gauge transformation, it's not a good, well-defined gauge function. But on the other hand, it acts properly on gauge field configurations and action is invariant under this transformation. Uh, so it's a global symmetry of the theory rather than a gauge symmetry of the theory. And under this global symmetry, it's immediate to see that states which are, uh, which wind around the circle, they charge under this global symmetry. Well, uh, normal operators like global operators, which don't have non-trivial winding, they're neutral. Uh, under, under this symmetry. So even if this string is long, so even if this state is heavier than uh, the global, uh, still you don't get contribution, you don't get contamination from, uh, 
from globals uh, from short strings in this two point function. So this is really the way, so the states which contribute from, from here, it's really these flux tubes which are stretched uh, over large distances. The circle, the circle is, is relatively large. So this is really the way to focus on the dy bullshit dynamics of the uh, QCD, uh, QCD string. Uh, and furthermore, well, if you just look at this correlator, of course, it's uh, the leading exponential asymptotics would be given by the ground state, the lightest uh, energy, uh, the state of the, with the lightest energy with this non-trivial winding, which would be uh, the ground state of the corresponding string. But then what people do, they produce a large enough uh, basis of these operators such that you can extract not only the leading exp exponent, but also subleading ones. And you can pr project on excited states with non-trivial quantum numbers. So it's very amusing. So in the papers on this subject, people write formulas like this, uh, which should be fun to uh, put in the, on the LaTeX. And actually, actually well, what that means to be that it's, it's, it's different shapes of the paths, which, which uh, kind of, they, they use these different uh, paths today to construct a large enough bank of operators to calculate this uh, two-point function. Uh, so now let me, so that's the calculation being done. For me, that's the experimental data, that's the measurement which being done. Uh, and the ambition is to well, understand this data and to learn something from it in analytical terms about uh, behavior of the QCD flux tube. And let me uh, give you a summary of several puzzles which were around uh, in this data. And I hope then I'll, uh, I'll explain to you the resol resolution of these some puzzles and the lessons which we learned from them. So first of all, well, puzzle number one is that there is a remar remarkable agreement with a theory, at least for some pieces of this data. So what's shown here, so here in the way which uh, I just, just described, you measure uh, energy of the flux tube as a function of its length. Uh, so here, this is the plot for ground state. So it's really it's kind of straight, st straight string which uh, wrapped around uh, <laughs> the circle. Uh, so these are data points and there are error bars here which is practically invisible. Uh, because this is a very accurate measurement. Uh, so actually here it's the same plot, but I subtracted the linearly growing part. So he, you see here there is a linearly growing part, which really telling you that you're looking at a string. So this is just to make it this plot more meaningful, I subtracted uh, this linearly growing part. Now you see error bars. Well, and there is a serial curve, which is very surprising. So this, uh, so this curve somewhere around here, around 1.7, I think, uh, it crosses zero, which corresponds uh, to a situation. Uh, so when the circle, the special circle becomes too small, the center symmetry becomes spontaneously broken. And then actually this string becomes, the string becomes the chaotic state, it condenses. So if you, in formal interpretation, that corresponds to the confinement phase transition. So that's one way to characterize the size of the string, the width of the strings, because it's not elementary string, it's a flux loop. Well, also distances here measured in, in the string units. So they measured the distances of uh, string weights. So at this point, it's really, it's not a long string. It's more like a blob, which is roughly twice longer than its, its width. So it's really dynamics, but when QCD is strongly coupled. So it's amazing to see that there is a theory which may uh, match experimental curves with, kind of, not with just at the order one level, but uh, with percent pre precision. So that's one puzzle, which well actually turned out to be that one is rather straightforward to resolve, and that actually was understood uh, before we started, before we were interested in this subject. So this particular plot. Uh, so puzzle number two, well, that actually the theory which agrees with data is known to be wrong. Uh, so here, what I've shown, I've shown again, these are data now not for ground state of a string, but for uh, some excited states. So these are very simple excitations. So here I have a string and I add one propagating of, like, say, uh, I add a single mode which propagates in one direction along the string. So there is a wiggle, let, left more, left more in phonon. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, actually, this is ground state and these are uh, states with, with extra phonon and the different curves correspond the different set of data points correspond to momentum, KK momentum of this phonon. So now here, solid lines is a theory calculation. So that's honest to God, and I'll explain momentarily what theory it is. But this is honest calculation. And one sees, so for long strings, and well, this calculation is expansion, which is supposed to work well for long strings. 
So for long strings it works. Well, the, for shorter strings it doesn't work for excited states. By itself, that's not a surprise. You expect your theory to break down for short strings. The surprise is that there is this other dashed curve which is shown here. And dashed curve is the following. So you take bosonic string, you do light quantization of that string in four dimensions, which, which we know is not the right thing to do because that wouldn't be relativistic theory. Uh, so bosonic, uh, fundamental bosonic string defined only, uh, it's relativistic only in 26 dimensions. So here we're in four dimensions, which, which is very far from 26, but you're just ignoring that fact, you plot that curve, and you see that uh, data points, they follow much better uh, this wrong curve rather than your careful calculation, which you have done doing correct perturbation theory. So that definitely looks puzzling. So furthermore, there is more going on for uh, other, other states. So what's shown here is the following. Now that's really interesting state. So this is a string excitation where you have two phonons, one left mover and right, one right mover. So now you have a long string and you really collide in two particles of the string. So this is uh, kind of a private collider which we share with lattice people and where we eventually go into discovering new particle. I'll, I'll try to explain you. Uh, and so now uh, these different colors, they refer now uh, to states. Uh, so when you have a uh, long string, you have residual uh, rotation symmetry along the axis of a string, if it were infinitely long, uh, so which is O2 symmetry. So these three different colors, that's, they refer to scalar, pseudo-scalar, and spin-2 uh, 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 multiplets for, for, for initial collision states. So there are three collision channels according to quantum numbers with respect to this O2. So, uh, so this green one is spin-2, actually, uh, on, in the continuum, that, that, that would be the generate point. So the splitting between two, these are two, two polarizations of spin two, and they are uh, split because uh, there is no real rotation symmetry on the lattice. There is just discrete subgroup of it, and uh, so uh, uh, that, that's supposed to be, uh, in the continuum, this point would coincide. So blue is uh, scalar, red is pseudo-scalar. Now here, well, solid lines again, this is honest to God, perturbative calculation, the same, the, same, the same kind. So clearly here it's totally useless in the uh, regime where there is any data available. Uh, dashed line uh, is again, is that prediction of light cone quantized string. And well, it works still surprisingly well, at least for two, two of the states, uh, but uh, so, somehow there is third one, which is pseudo-scalar, which looks different here. Uh, so only one dashed line. Yeah, because like on quantized strings, they it predicts that all these three states would be degenerate. Ah, okay. So there's, a, there's no splitting between different multiplets of fundamental string, uh, which is clearly not the case in, in actual data. Well, but still for spin two and, and scalar, it's close to be the case up, up to relatively short uh, string lengths. Uh, so yeah, so this is just to show you, this is the wrong theory. This is the formula for, for the spectrum uh, of this wrong theory, this is uh, what lattice people were calling Nambugota spectrum. So they said you just take the bosonic string, you do light cone quantization, and you ignore the fact that it's not a, a non-relativistic uh, theory. But I don't want to ignore that, uh, uh, that fact. And for me, Nambugota is really relativistic, a theory of relativistic string. So instead I will be referring to this series light cone or GGRT to acknowledge these guys uh, who actually did this calculation in 1973. So as I said, the puzzle is, so this theory describes data much better than actual honest to God calculation. However, it's not supposed to, to work uh, at, at d equal, d equal four. Uh, so that's uh, really the puzzle we want to resolve first. Uh, so let me now describe for you this honest calculation which I was referring to. Uh, and this is cal calculation, well, it's based on effective field theory lo logic and for, uh, to effective field theories, first you start with a very long string. So a very long string is a system of Goldstone bosons, which correspond to spontaneous breaking of uh, target space Poincaré symmetry to uh, product of the uh, symmetry of rotations in the transverse plane uh, and the Poincaré symmetry on the, along the string. So this is the coset. Uh, so you want to 
right, uh, effective field, and this, this is your theory, and the assumption that there are no additional massless particles on the whole sheet of a string, which is, well, first of all, you will see it agrees with the data, and is that what you expect for QCD? Because there is no reason, massless particles don't appear for no good reason, and there is no reason in QCD for extra massless particles. So they, they don't appear. Uh, well, and uh, so, the, then the, the fields in this effective field series, they're just position, transverse fluctuations of a string. So there are d minus 2 in general number of dimensions, d minus 2 scalar fields living on this two-dimensional theory. So it's two-dimensional theory because we started with four-dimensional young mill theory. But there is a gap in the bulk. So in the presence of a, bulk, of a string, uh, at energies below the mass of uh, light as global, I have effective two-dimensional theory which describes perturbations uh, on the string. So in this two-dimensional theory, I have d minus 2 scalar fields, and the non-trivial part is that they enjoy the joy of course rotation symmetry acting on them, but also they enjoy non-linearized full target space Poincaré symmetry uh, when they are transformation corresponding transformations. So then you can follow construction which is very close to construction how you build pi and Lagrangian. It's a little bit more tricky here because it's a space-time symmetry, but still you can do it. So analog of kind of sigma model field, analog of U field in pi and Lagrangian is this object. You take a vector based on space-time two-dimensional coordinates and physical excitations, transverse excitation of a string. So of course, this is just geometrically, this is embedding of a string in the target space-time. And then you write action, which is the sum of geometric invariants constructed uh, from the, for, 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 this, for this embedding. So in particular, the leading term is the Nambugote term, it's just the area of the uh, surface. And then the next correction, well, actually this one, it's kind of attracted lots of attention. It's called rigidity term. It's a square of extrinsic curvature. But from effective field theory, it's not very interesting because it vanishes uh, on shelf. But then there are higher order corrections, and you expect infinite number of them. But and then the strategy of this honest calculation is the following. So you take this theory, you do the real the expansion. So you work, so you your expansion parameter, so there is a dimensional full quantity here, which is the tension of a string. <coughs> so you uh, expansion parameter is a ratio of the tension of the string, which is basically like width of the string over the length of the string. Uh, and you just proceed as you do for pines. So, but it's even better here because the symmetry is not broken. Uh, so this, uh, the symmetry here, these are exact Goldstone bosons. Uh, so in particular, you, know, you get Lagrangian, which well, we start, start with a free, bunch of free bosons, and then there will be uh, derivative interactions, portic derivative interactions. and these coefficients, they are fixed by requiring that this expansion comes from finding the square root, which is consequence of Lorentz symmetry. So this is consequence the fact that we're talking about relativistic string. Well, and of course, it's interacting, in fact, non-normalizable, but healthy effective field theory, which is not diff doesn't look any different uh, from uh, pine Lagrangian. Uh, well, there is a very interesting and fascinating question here, which, well, if you proceed that way, that's how effective field theories would be thinking about strings. If you go along this, 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 this way, there is, a, I think, really fascinating question. That actually, that, that, that was the question which uh, attracted me into this business. I never in my life before cared about lattice QCD. Uh, Sorry, so the seats here are like a dimension huh? for confidence. Yeah, there's a dimension for, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so the question, if you proceed in this way, it doesn't look for any number of flavors, it doesn't look principally different from just theory of pi or any other theory of Goldstone bosons. So in this language, how would effective field theorists thinking about this theory, how would he observe that when you have 24 flavors, that this theory is somehow different, so something special happens? Well, and I, and project of the answer would be that even though this theory always looks non-animalizable, always looks as effective field theory, it's in some sense actually a well-defined microscopic theory uh, when you have exactly 24 flavors. And, well, as here I'm saying renormalizable, but that was what was my colloquium yesterday about. It is, it's not quite renormalizable. It's, it's very unusual. It's this E to the S theory, which I was talking about yesterday. So it's a very unusual kind of uh, 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 theory. Uh, but you can ignore the few, uh, if you remember anything from what I was telling uh, you yesterday. You can forget all this. So let's just try to think about this question from scratch. So. Oh, we have this Lagrangian, we're trying to understand to find the first place if you effective field series where you would see 
that d equal 26 is special. Well, so if you're effective field theorist, the simplest quantity which you may want to calculate is just to calculate scattering of these particles. So you have these pines, let's, ca let's calculate the corresponding scattering amplitude. Uh, well, and this amplitude will be invariant so, uh, under rotations around the string, so general, uh, so that d minus 2 invariant amplitude takes this form. And uh, well, there is, so this ij, kl, ij, the flavor indices of incoming particles, kl, uh, in flavor indices out outgoing particles. So this first term to play, play <laughs> special significance in what follows, this corresponds to annihilation. So it corresponds to, so you start with a string which oscillates in one plane, you kind of have two wiggles, corresponding to oscillation plane, in one plane, you collide two particles and strings start oscillating in the orthogonal plane. So if this term is non-zero, uh, that what would be happening. You do calculation and you find that there were two quartic vortices on the previous slide and you find that for Nambuco the choice of coefficients of these quartic vortices uh, they, uh, they are such that well actually this A term it vanishes so there are no annihilations and the amplitude takes, takes this uh, simple form so that's three levels so that's telling relativistic string that's a special property of relativistic string classical relativistic string well it's kind of it starts at th and also at three levels, so quantum uh, relativistic string, but at three levels, if it were initially oscillating in one plane, it will keep oscillating the plane forever, so there is no way you will excite it in the orthogonal direction. Okay, we can go on. Uh, and, well, actually, the interesting property of this effective field theory, uh, so let me come back here. So, in pines, we're used to the fact that at three level, so there is a leading term in the Lagrangian which determines three level amplitude, but the moment you go at, at the loop level, you need to add also counter terms. You need to add uh, higher order corrections to the Lagrangian. So, in that sense, there are more, more parameters which appear in this theory. Well, here it turns out that uh, at the one loop level, there is still no non trivial counter term. So, uh, if you could write the, the possible counter terms would be this k squared term, but as I already told you, it vanishes on shell, meaning it doesn't really contribute to scattering amplitudes. There is also Einstein term, but Einstein term in two dimensions is total derivative, so again, it, it doesn't contribute. Well, and then, you, uh, then there is uh, gauss banner relation, which so that, that's all that you have at this order. So there, there are two independent terms, but both of them are trivial. They, neither of them contribute to uh, one loop scattering. So the special property of this series, opposed to uh, pines, that also one loop scattering here is universal. It just follows from leading of the Lagrangian. Uh, so you can go ahead and do the calculations. So there are kind of diagrams like this. Uh, and what you find? Well, you find that there is d minus 26, which appears in the, as a result of the calculation. Now, uh, namely, this one loop amplitude, well, it has imaginary part, which just follows from unitarity. That's the trivial part. But then, you find that there is extra term uh, which has non zero annihilation and, uh, and which is proportional to, to d minus 26. So, well, that's the first place where you can see, oh, something strange going on here. So, this property that bosonic or relativistic string oscillates in one plane, it preserved at the quantum level only in 26 dimensions. Uh, and, and they, well, I gave a talk about it here a couple of years ago. So, well, there was an interesting story. So, th this, this is the same effect, which was uh, in completely different language in different gauge, was what was called Alchinsky's Stromager interaction. Uh, and there was some confusion about that. But, uh, that I, I will call this contribution to the amplitude uh, as Alchinsky's Stromager amplitude, even though they didn't talk about, uh, didn't talk about this uh, scattering. They, they were describing the same effect in completely different language. Uh, so, well, actually, this, uh, so that was uh, already, this is what I told you, uh, is already enough to explain uh, the puzzle number one, which I, uh, which I uh, described before, namely, uh, why uh, ground state data so well described by this perturbation theory. Yeah, but by the way, so the, old, like the honest calculation was the following. So you take this theory, and then what you want to do, you, you put it in a finite volume, and you calculate the spectrum of, finite volume spectrum of that theory. So this is what's being measured on the lattice. And the way people were doing it, you had this Lagrangian, you just put on a, uh, put in a, in a circle, do Fourier expansion or KK decomposition, so you get quantum mechanics of infinite number of moles, then if you work at written, some given order in the derivative expansion, you truncate, and you calculate, you perturbatively calculate uh, uh, 
uh, you, you, you perturbatively uh, calculate uh, energies expansion in one on R. So that was the way, that was honest calculation. It's, it's correct calculation, uh, you can do that. Uh, so from the argument which I presented to you, it follows, well, that actually uh, all the terms in this expansion up to the order 1 over r to the fifth, they're completely fixed by symmetries. And uh, the, way, uh, the way to, the fast way to calculate them is the following. So at the Lagrangian level, so the interesting part, so the interesting part about uh, this term, even though it came out as a result of uh, one loop calculation, it still looks like a local term. So you can add a local counter term to the Lagrangian, which would produce this scattering amplitude. That's what's called rational term in the uh, amplitudes. Uh, it's a local term, but nevertheless, well, there is no Lorentz invariant in target space point of view, uh, amplitude, uh, low counter term which you can write. So it's for a relativistic string, there is nothing you can do about this, uh, this contribution. But you can write a, uh, you can add a counter term like that. You can determine the Lagrangian like this, which is rotationally invariant, it's two-dimensionally Lorentz invariant, but it doesn't respect non full non-linearized Poincaré symmetry of the target space time. What is that guy geometrically? Huh? No, it doesn't have, this term doesn't have geometric meaning. That's, 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 that's the whole point. Well, well rather, to, it's, it doesn't, well, you, you may think about, well, it comes from expansion of some non-local geometric invariant. But, right, but it doesn't, yeah, so it's not a legitimate term to add to the Lagrangian. So it's not invariant, no, by itself, it just has no geometric meaning period. That's why you can, it's not allowed counter term if you add it in, if you have an relativistic theory, so. Uh, but however, at the level of the Lagrangian, so this is the first correction in derivative expansion between QCD, which is a relativistic string, and between light cone theory, which is uh, well-to-do relativistic two-dimensional theory, not four-dimensional theory, but two-dimensional theory. So this is the first difference. But and then just by doing dimensional analysis, so you can see, oh, the, if, you, in this, if you put this theory on the finite volume, you just count how many derivatives you have here, you'll find the first correction to differences in the spectra between these two theories, it will come at the order one over r to the fifth. And moreover, this calculation, is, this correction is calculable. All you need to do is just, well, uh, you need to calculate matrix elements of this operator between states of, of, of the light cone theory. So that's a very fast way uh, to calculate uh, finite volume spectrum of this theory up to the order one over to the fifth. And so these solid lines, these are result of this calculation. And by the way, so the fact that this term introduces annihilation, in terms of the spectrum, well, it's immediate to see it translates to the property that it splits different multiples of, of uh, SOD minus two. So it's immediate to see that, uh, well, that this effect that you can collide two particles in one plane and they go to another plane, it translates in the fact, well, that different multiples with respect to SOD minus two with finite volume now have different energies. So these solid lines, they come from there. Uh, and, well, and you can see, well, it just doesn't work for excited states. So it's, it's, it works for long strings, but not the ones which are being measured on the lattice. On the other hand, for, for the ground state, it works. So if you follow the same logic, actually, you find that that matrix element for the ground state energy, first of all, this one over r to the fixed correction vanishes. So this argument proves that in, for ground state energy of a string, all the terms up to one over r to the fifth, they're universal and just come from the expansion of the ground state energy for light cone theory. And then, well, this miracle that perturbation theory works so well, well, this is just miracle of Taylor expansion. So, yes, you expand it in the parameter, which is kind of order one, but as soon as you are within the radius of convergence, well, if you know first five terms in your Taylor expansion, well, they approximate function, your, your function uh, pretty well, actually. Here, you, you don't even see it here. So, here there are two lines, actually. One line is the exact ground state energy for light cone quantized string, and another, the sum of these five terms. And clearly, well, you, you, you can see the difference. So for ground state, there is there's no, no, no mystery indeed. So, uh, so all, all, all what happens is known universal terms, there are sufficiently many of them, uh, such that uh, you, you get the right answer, well, within the currently, uh, current errors. Uh, but clearly, we need to work harder for excited states because for excited states, again, so this, so the sum of universal terms shown by these uh, dotted lines and dashed lines is a full light cone answer for the, spe for the spectrum, which, which is not 
correct one, uh, but it matches data much better uh, than uh, the universal terms. And of course, if, if you see a plot like that, well, the first thought is, okay, this is a bad expansion. So there is a radius of convergence, and for somehow for these short strings, it becomes asymptotic. So you have the regime when expansion is asymptotic. So, but there should be a better expansion because wrong theory cannot match the data for no good reason. So that's a clear sign that uh, there is there should be a way to reorganize to, to do different calculation of finite volume spectrum, which would explain uh, explain also this data. Uh, and to get a hint of how to organize this calculation, it's instructive actually just to look at the light cone spectrum and to see what is the difference. Why expansion works so nicely? One of our expansion works so nicely for ground states and uh, just fails badly for excited states. And the difference is that the spectrum is given by the square root formula. So, uh, well, there you expand, assuming that r r is large. So this is your this is large thing. All the others are supposed to be small. Well, and uh, okay, there is a branch singularity for square root. So there is a radius of convergence for this expansion, and for ground states, there are no n until this equal to zero. So the expansion is good as, <laughs> as soon as this, this term is larger than uh, this thing, which is quite a small number. On the other hand, <laughs> for excited states, there are extra terms which are multiplied by powers of two pi's. And two pi is a large number. So it's like six, so it matters here. So for ground state, expansion works roughly as, as soon as ls of r is order one, and for excited states, the less of r should be 1 over 2 pi. And that's, that's, that makes a whole difference. Well, so the idea is that <laughs> somehow we need to expand in 1 over 2 pi. So we need to re reorganize our perturbative expansion such that to take care of this fact. Uh, and we can't do it <coughs> because we know where these 2 pi's are coming from. So really, physically, for excited states, energy of a string is a function of two different physical things. So it's a string with excitations on top of it. So it's a function, the energy of your state is a function of just momentum of these excitations. And momentum of these excitations, they quantize in units 2 pi of r. So that's where 2 pi's came from. Well, and then there are genuinely finite volume effects. So there's the dependence on the less of r. Now, what one does in standard perturbation theory, one mixes up these two variables. So one replaces uh, momentum by 2 pi n of r and expands in the less of r and then turns with 2 pi and without 2 pi they get mixed to each other. So the, what one wants to do, one wants to find a way to calculate finite energy in such a way that to keep this physical difference between two different variables on which energy depends. Uh, and the idea is the following. So you want to calculate finite volume spectrum in two steps. So first, just as we were doing before, you want to calculate infinite volume scattering ma matrix on the, on the, on the volume of a string. So you, you calculate uh, scattering of these phonons. And this is the standard perturbative expansion in PLS parameters. So that's, that's expansion in the momentum. Well, and then, in principle, that's a completely different question. So, but we believe that S matrix for quantum field theory, in principle, carries all the information about quantum field theory. In particular, it carries the information what is the finite volume spectrum of this theory. So there is no even, in principle, there is no even need to make the second step perturbatively. If you already calculate this matrix, well, there should be a formula which tells you what is the finite volume spectrum. So this is the idea. So to, to make the calculation in two steps, in practice, this is a very hard question. So how to go from knowing amplitudes to finding volume spectrum, it's hard. Uh, and it's known there are several approaches which are <coughs> related to each other. So in massive series, this was de developed by Lusher, and uh, one does it perturbatively. Uh, and essentially, but and the corrections, uh, so it's corrections coming from and virtual particles going around the uh, uh, compact dimensions. That's why I call it winding corrections. Uh, and they're exponentially suppressed in massive series, and th that's very good. Uh, that's one situation where people know how to do it. Another situation in integrable two dimensional series, there is a technique called thermodynamic beta ansatz, which is, well, which is the machine to calculate from S, go from S matrix uh, to exact finite volume spectrum. Well, however, our theory, neither relativistically, well, don't know, neither massive, sorry, nor integrable. So, well, it seems uh, we're doomed, but 
Uh, actually, the point is that as a consequence of Lorentz, Lorentz and Vanden linearized Lorentz and Marians, perturbatively, this S matrix, it approaches integrable GGRT theory at low energy. So the idea is to use this thermodynamic beta and ZAS technique, which should work at low stored in perturbation theory, and then try to incorporate corrections uh, perturbatively yeah, in, in this calculation. So let me now first illustrate to you how it works for uh, bosonic string itself. So I already told you yesterday, so this is, okay, now you can re recall some facts from my talk, so that this is the S matrix, so for light cone quantized bosonic string, the claim which I made yesterday and which I illustrate now, that actually exact S matrix is just E to the IS, but you don't need to think about this as an exact S matrix. For my purposes, you may think, okay, I'm calculating phase shift, I'm calculating perturbatively in the momentum expansion, at least in order it would be just equal to S, S L S squared over four. So at least in order in uh, momentum expansion, this is what you get. And well, this answer looks like phase shift of integrable theory. Uh, so one can apply uh, this thermodynamic beta and that's uh, technique. Uh, and, well, I, I, don't, I won't go through all the details of yesterday, but just I re re uh, recall that this is a very interesting theory. That's where connection with quantum gravity came, comes from. So the theory has interesting UV behavior, uh, and the fastest way to see relation with gravity is that this phase shift coincides with iconal uh, scattering phase shift in gravitational theories, which is a little, little, at the moment looks a little bit mysterious. So it would be nice to come up with some uh, good physical explanation why uh, iconal scattering in gravity is the same, described by the same phase shift as the scattering of excitation on, on a whole sheet of a string. But, but for me then that doesn't matter that much. Uh, so so let, let me tell you now what this thermodynamic beta and that is. Uh, so this is a tool invented by Zemalotchikov uh, and well, there are essentially two ideas. One idea is that uh, for Lorentz invariant theory, calculating ground state on a circle is the same as uh, calculating uh, partition thermal partition function. So depending on which di di direction you think of as uh, time and which one is space, you may think, so uh, in the limit when L goes to infinity, in the limit when one of the di direction becomes large, uh, you may think about it, it's either dominated by lowest energy, so if you think about L as time, then uh, in this limit, uh, the part this par uh, partition function is dominated by low lowest energy state on this circle, so you're calculating ground state Casimir energy. If you think about it as space, then you're calculating free energy in the infinite volume limit. Now, in infinite volume limit, well, so, and the trick is to, to think about it in this way, to think about this calculation as the uh, finite temperature calculation, but infinite volume, in an infinite volume limit, these binding corrections, they go away. Particles don't, can't go around the world because the world is infinitely long. Uh, so uh, the idea is that just to write quantization conditions, so to calculate this uh, free energy just by writing uh, modified quantization conditions for particles in this theory in the presence of these scattering phase shifts. And that's what's called asymptotic beta and that's. So, and, well, that's some, it's, it's easy to understand what this condition is. So here I illustrated it just for two particles. So basically you look at the uh, say form factor like that, just two point function, matrix element between vacuum and the two particle states. So that, that you are in a circle, so that should be a periodic function. And you impose this periodicity in the presence of scattering of particles. So if there were no scattering, well, that would be the condition. P is equal to two pi times n, but in the presence of uh, of, of scattering, periodicity condition is modified, you get extra phase shift here. Uh, and now, then when, when phase shift grows, then these particles, these momenta, they become, they're getting softer. Uh, and that's, actually, that, to a large extent, that explains why this technique will work better than naive perturbative expansion. Because here, already at the zero order level in your perturbation theory, remember, perturbation theory was expansion in P. So whether it works well or good is determined by whether momenta are small or large. And here already at the first step, when, because phase shift grows, the momenta are not given by just two, which uh, is R, which I forget, here there is everything multiplied no, by, by, by L. Yeah, so uh, the, but the, uh, the no, so by R, sorry, by, by the cycle string. So the momenta are not equal just to pi N over R, 
but they're smaller than that because there is a positive contribution here. And that's what helps to, uh, to improve the, the, this perturbative expansion. So, uh, yeah, then, then, well, you have this perturbative quantization condition, then what you do, you just calculate free energy, and you get this expression of free energy, well, this kind of this, this standard, uh, well, this is expression, there is a standard uh, 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 thermal uh, expression where the energy of this, uh, the quasi energy of these particles is determined, comes from solving this equation. And, well, there, where it turns out where this phase shift which you have here turns out to be particularly nice. So, in general, what would stay here, there would be derivative of phase shift with respect to P prime, and this would be, well, not so complicated, but still integral equation for, for function epsilon. But when phase shift for GGRT phase shift, when it's just product of P left times P right, uh, well, this derivative, it, 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 so all, all dependence on P, it, it, it comes as an overall factor here. So this equation actually, well, it's not the integral equation, it's just, it's telling you that uh, the energy is linear in P, and to find the coefficient of, of, function, of proportionality, you just need to calculate this integral, and then you get quadratic equation which you solve, and you get the answer. Well, and that's how you uh, reproduce, so, so from here you reproduce correct ground state energy of a bosonic string. Uh, well, which is yet another way to uh, to calculate. Uh, so that's the leading order uh, expression. Uh, uh, in these expansions, that's the leading order uh, answer for ground state energy for QCD flux tube. But we're, we're not after ground state. We, we wanted to do it for excited states. So for excited states, the story is somewhat more complicated. So that goes on, it goes under the name excited states thermodynamic weight and that's and it was invented by Dory and Tateo. Uh, so the physical idea is very simple. So if you know ground state of your system as a function of large enough number of parameters, then you may analytically continue in these parameters, and this, as these parameters take complex values, there will be some branching points in the complex plane. As you go around these branching, point, uh, branching points, as you adiabatically change this parameter and then come back, there will be monodromies such that you start from ground state and then you come back and you're uh, actually in excited state now. So this is the idea of the calculation. So if you want to know excited states of the system, it's enough to know ground state of the system as a function of large enough number of parameters. And the parameters in this case are just chemical potentials for individual particles. So after you go through this exercise, so you get now this intimidating look looking set of equations. But actually, well, the structure is very simple. So here what I've shown in red, so now I have a bunch of particles, but so in red, this is just a symptotic weight answer. So this is, we have a bunch of particles and with modified quantization condition, and the energy is given by just as a contribution proportional to R, that's the vacuum energy plus kinetic energies of all these particles. And all the rest, well, it looks like there is some thermal bus, this is a system interaction, it's a thermal like looking <coughs> integrals, and they, they're responsible for finite size correction. So these are, these terms are responsible for these winding, uh, winding effects. Uh, and it does look as, as a little bit of a mess, but again, the same miracle happens. So here, there is this derivative of the, del the phase shift with respect to P prime. So in general, that would be a complicated uh, system of integral equations. <coughs> but in this case, uh, this just proportional to, to P. So this in system of integral equations reduces to just a system of quadratic equations, which you can solve and get square root formula. Uh, so the strategy now is just to try to, so we, for, we, we know corrections to scattering on the flux tube bullshit, so uh, the strategy is now incorporate corrections to S matrix perturbatively into, into these equations. And it's hard to do in full generality, but it turns out that also at one loop level, uh, this theory is perturbatively integrable. So if, if, taking this Polchinski Strominger phase into account, there are annihilations of particles, so flavor does get changed, but still at this level there is still no particle production. And moreover, uh, because to implement the strategy for a particle state, well, we need to know, even so it's integrable, the flavor changes as a result of scattering, so you need to be able to diagonalize n particle S matrix for the system, but here you can do it explicitly. It turns out it's very simple. Yes. So I just I just want to make sure I'm I'm, I'm sort of following the yeah. so the, the this 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 uh, beta ansatz thermodynamic beta ansatz for um, ground state and excited states 
That is an exact statement. If you knew the exact S matrix, that would give you the exact, uh, the exact. Um, well, uh, no, it should be integral. It should be integrable theory. And it has to be integrable. Yes, yeah, it has to be so integrable so theory. If it's for an integrable theory, it gives you the exact. Answer. Right. Yes. So what you're basically doing is plugging in the approximation for the S matrix. Yeah, and the, and the order it's, I'm working, it, this approximation turns out to be integrable. So I can use I can use this machine. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but so even it gives you a different sort of perturbation theory from right. just the direct calculation using the effective Lagrangian. Yes, right, yes, yes. And is it, do you want, I mean, is there some way of understanding it in the sense of it be some certain corrections or what? Yeah, 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 but that's, what that's, that's what, what I said that's here, that's what I was saying here. There's some, it's, it's kind of, it's, there's something like better salpeter There's some, the, so you start from different dispersion relations in some sense. You used to, just, uh, so, for instance, for particle with a single phonon, in some sense, when you're in a circle, you may think that it propagates in a thermal bath. And what you are accounting for, you're accounting for the dispersion relation in this case, but propagator is different. So you're using not free propagator. So this, it, one can really trace it from uh, this uh, radius of convergence when the pr standard perturbation theory breaks down, it corresponds to the following. You're on, on a circle, but the circle is so small that actually what you would call a left mover becomes a right mover, roughly something. So, so there's, there's really propagator. There's some non ellipticity in the propagator, uh, which which is not captured by free by free by free propagator. So, uh, so that, 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 that's what's what happens here. So the, yeah. So but really this is just this effect. So it's like you expand in about right uh, like zero zero approximation. You take out for the fact that. Uh, dispersion relation is modified. Yeah, so we do have physical understanding for this. Yeah, and but I should say even for integrable theory, in general, it's not trivial to write this set of equations because you, it's not enough to know S matrix because if there are flavor changing processes, you need to diagonalize n particle S matrix, which is, which is non trivial. But uh, it, it, it is in this case for for our one loop S matrix, which also turns out to be integrable. Uh, so uh, uh, you can do it. Well, and that's, that's <coughs> simple. I just don't have time to go to it. Well, you can do it, and so that's order again. You can use this machine. So let's use this machine. Well, so this is the answer which you get for uh, late left movements. So that's solid lines for previous effective field theory calculation. Now, really, this plot shows it's really boring. These states are boring, as they should be, because it's a single particle propagating in one direction. So what's shown here, the dotted lines, here I'm just showing just three particles. So if I take a circle, I, I put a free particle in the circle, didn't think about any interactions, that's what would I get. And actually, that's correct, that's the leading order, that was, uh, this technique gives us the leading order answer. Now, if you calculate first correction, well, it gives the answer which is the same as, for this case, the second order the leading correction becomes the answer square root formula, the answer of light cone quantized bosonic string. So you accounted for uh, binding correction. So actually, yeah, it, it, you, this, that would, the, 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 the dashed lines here. So they work, so you improve a little bit. So it goes in the right, right direction as you expected. But really, morally, this space, these states are very boring. So it's essentially just free, free particles. You have a single free particle propagating in a circle, and there is some uh, small binding correction effect. Just this. Standard way of doing perturbation theory was somehow terribly wrong. So, that, that, uh, well, not wrong, but, but just not practical. Uh, uh, the pending around wrong, wrong zeros at the point. Uh, so let's go to interesting uh, uh, state. So that was situation in the standard perturbation theory. Now, if you do, if you follow this approach, well, this is what you get. So, okay, that's that's it. Does look much better. So, in particular here, it was not even clear, so which state is wrong somehow. People will say, no, actually red state looks a little, so I, I recall that in, in this order, blue and red are predicted to be degenerate. Yeah, I didn't say that. So actually, the palchinsky strominger interaction, it splits different multiples, but it still uh, keeps scalar and pseudo-scalar degenerate. So it predicts, so that's why there are only two lines here. So red and blue are predicted to be degenerate, and people were saying, actually, red doesn't look that bad, at least for long enough strings. So there's something strange going on here. Well, when you 
do this calculation, actually you find the opposite. So you find, well, actually blue looks kind of good. Green looks also much better, but not so good. But also there is a simple reason to that. So remember, I, I, I told you that how good expansion is is determined by the momentum, right? And the formula here, there is kind of zeros of the phase shift, plus there is one loop correction equal to, uh, to bar. So this is the formula. So it turns out that this correction comes with different sign to, uh, to green and blue. So we understand where these curves don't work. So we uh, terminate this curve here, not be because it's uh, uh, obviously not a good approximation to data here, but this point was chosen such we uh, chose the value of the momentum and roughly one loop correction to the phase shift becomes a for the three level one. So we expect this perturbation theory to break down here. On the other hand, for in the case where this one loop correction being a bit positive to three level result, and that's for this blue and red, so here it, it works all the way till very short strings. So there is a way, we understand qualitatively what's going on, we understand why it works better for blue than for green. And also it's clear at this point that there is something totally wrong with red ones. Because red morally they the same as blue. And the, the difference between red and uh, all the rest is splitting is much larger. So you, you have no hope that you'll fix this just by next next order perturbation theory. Uh, so clearly, there is some quality to the new, new effect here, which is not captured by the theory. Well, but also it's striking. Well, actually, this point. So remember, I'm showing always energy with vacuum energy sub subtracted. Well, they're practically independent of the size of a string. So you would get the same thing if you had, say, if you have a massive, massive particle in your theory, massive unstable particle, which you add it on the whole sheet of the flux tube, then you would get uh, uh, such a state. So we just Unperturbed streak with extra massive state. So let's do this. Let's let's just add this particle when particular theory. So we know how to do it. Last bit. Why is it flat again? No, it's flat. That's that. that it's it, in data. It's flat. It, it's flat. And we interpret it as the following: You have a string, and this fluctuation. The way to think about it, you just add a single particle, massive particle, li living on a string. So that would <coughs> naturally explain this, this flatness. Okay, that is the part I don't understand. Why would it be flat if it's a natural? Ah, because the total energy is just ground state energy. Because we're showing here the difference between excited state energy and ground state energy. So this difference, independently of the length of a string, it would be just equal to the mass of a particle. I see. So that's, that's, that's really the measurement of the, of the mass of this particle. So oh. a particle in, in the sense that it's localized. Yeah, it's a localized, okay. it's a localized excitation of, of a string. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, let's do that. Let's just, we have a vector field theory, <coughs> so we know how to add particles in our theory. We just add, and it should be a pseudo-scalar. Uh, so, well, this is, you just write the scalar Lagrangian, and this is the first uh, interaction term, so first pseudo-scalar interaction. And actually, it's a very uh, interesting interaction. So if, if there were no this phi here. Sorry, yeah. can you just go back? Is it somehow, can you, sorry, I should have asked this before, but if you go back to your prediction, your new red and blue curves <coughs> lying right on top of each other. I yeah, my, yeah that, because the so patient, I would yeah. presume that that is something you could have understood without doing the detailed calculation. Right, but, the, but before, the, but before it wasn't even clear whether it's red no, no, or blue. I understand blue. that, right. but yeah. I just want to understand, so is that is that in some kind of all-order statement or exact statement? Would that break down into next order of perturbation theory or what? Uh, yeah, I see no reason why, why it should be, be, keep it higher than in perturbation theory. I expect it to, to break down. But on the other hand, now we're saying, look, this deviation, this splitting here, is much larger yeah. than what we're getting in this order in perturbation theory. I mean, so there is, it, it's very unlikely that it will get fixed just by second order corrections. But was it surprising that the one loop thing, the, the, the one loop red and blue curves right on top of each other, or is that expected? Uh, well, that came out from the, the way this Polchinski theorem measure phase shift looks like, and let, 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 let me try to remember uh, what, what, what the other reason for that. I don't remember on top of my head, but we thought about it. Maybe there was a way. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, okay. uh, yeah, I don't remember on top of my head. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so, start saying, so, 
this interaction, this is just leading all the pseudo scalar interaction which one can add. But it's kind of interesting because, well, if there were no phi here, so this term that would be a very interesting term in the string Lagrangian, that would be a topological environment, which is special for string in four dimensional space time because, well, you have. If you think about bullshit of a string in the four-dimensional space-time, it's a uh, co-dimension one-half surface. So you can write, define topological invariant which uh, calculates the number of self-intersections of the this, this surface. Similar, if you draw the curve on a plane, you can calculate this number. So on a plane, it would be defined only mod z2. Uh, but uh, in four-dimensional space-time, it's, it's just it's, uh, this number itself is well defined. So uh, this topological invariant, but in some, some sense, it's analog of theta term uh, in the st string action. And so this particle, which couples to the theta term, in that sense, it's something like an axion. And uh, that's the reason why we call it bullshit uh, axion. And so it, it's very special interaction, which present only for uh, strings in four dimensions. So we can do that, and well, it, then every, now it's everything straightforward. So now we have extra contribution to phase shift coming from just exchange of this particle. Uh, and I just show this flash. So there was this intimidating set of equations which I showed to you, but at the end, full calculation, this is this whole set of equations, this thermodynamic patterns that that what it reduces to. Uh, uh, three lines of quadratic equations and, and one, one page of Mathematica which produces for you uh, the resulting curves. Uh, and now we have two new parameters we have mass and coupling constant, but mass essentially you can determine it by i, it's just this, this energy. So there is one parameter which you feed, and when you do this feedback, that's the answer uh, which you get. So now it looks much better. Uh, and of course, well, it's my, it proved much more than you would expect just by randomly adding one new parameter. Because it's important that when you add it, so that's very useful to have effective field theory, because when you added this particle, of course, you're not surprised that these red lines are fixed now. That was Basically, that was built in uh, in the story. Uh, so this, uh, you, you have this resonance in the S channel, but also it contrib contributes in the TU channel and affects now blue and green lines. And moreover, the sign of that contribution uh, is, is, doesn't change as your very alpha parameter. So the fact that the agreement become better here, it, it could happen that these lines would be further out from each other. There is nothing. We, we, there is no parameter here which would. Uh, be able to use to fix that. So here uh, they, it goes in the right direction, uh, and so the best fit value you get the mass of these particles in string units 1.85. So in physical units it's something like it's 750 MeV. So it's roughly half of the mass of the lightest blue ball. Actually, it's very close to the half of the ma light of the mass of the lightest blue ball. So I don't know is there is it numerology or what, uh, but it's so it's it's below the uh, gap. So it's within effective field theory. Well, it's actually, it's not that broad. It's relatively uh, narrow resonance. And it's somewhat surprise. So for me, at least, and for many people, I think the expectation would be that the, well, you expect, in principle, there could be some breathing modes of QCD flux field. But the expectation for many people was it should be something like a Liouville mode. It should be a scalar excitation. Well, instead, instead here there is, oh, well, we'll see later. So there is no sign of a scalar. But this pseudo scale, so geometrically, is more like a twist of a string. So it's Breathing mode, but it's not uh, uh, circular symmetric. It's, it's kind of it's asymmetric. It's a pseudo scalar, so it's twisting the string. So, so how did you know ahead of time that it was a pseudo scalar? I guess I never. No, no, that well, that comes from data. It just because so this this is done almost. The fact that the data is fit with the huh? the fact that the data is fit by the anti-symmetric structure, or did you know before? No, no, just looking at these data points, we saw that the, so when we looked at these red ones, those correspond to pseudo-scalar state, and they clearly totally off, and moreover, they're, they're independent of the, uh, the energy. So we well, knew... So that's just the way to extract it from the lattice that we're looking for that. Right, yes, so, yeah, yes. Okay. So from looking from this lattice data, we knew that we need to add pseudo-scalar. Well, and actually one may do something different. And again, that's what people routinely do on the lattice in four dimensions. So we can turn this logic around and say, well, let's not try to write any theory for, for this, what's going on here, but let's try to use this finite volume energies to and use the thermodynamic beta ansatz equation to extract from these equations the scattering amplitudes. And that's what people do when they determine on the lattice 
yes, you know, scattering, scattering amplitude for pions from lattice data. So it's, and it's actually, this technique was developed by Lusher, and he was the guy who also invented this effective field theory, but somehow it's funny he never applied his technique in the context of this uh, string effective field theory, so he used different method there. For, for somehow people didn't think about this in terms of scattering. Uh, so, yeah, if you do that, that's what you get. So, uh, so here, again, uh, so this is just, th th that's the exercise we did. Without putting, like, for, forget about curves for a moment, just data points, we redraw these data points. Now the uh, plane where the phase shift is a function of momenta, but then you see if you look at the scalar and uh, spin two, well, it just, gr it, it grows, uh, relatively featureless, and now dashed lines, that's a phase shift for a theory without pseudo-scalar, solid lines with a pseudo-scalar. Well, one can see very nice resonance. So one can see the phase shift. So actually here I added more data points. So this, these extra points here, that's excited states. There's, there's also measurements for state, states with more, 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 more states with the same quantum numbers. So what we see here is basically the uh, avoided level crossing phenomenon. And when you put the states on the a uh, single phase shift plot, you see classic phase shift, it, it goes through pi over 2. Uh, and actually there are even more states, it gets noisy and noisier, but uh, so, yeah, but it's an interesting cross-check here. So these are the states uh, where you have, now total momentum is not zero, so you have, it, so you may think of these other red points here, this, uh, you, you have, and if you boosted your particle, so there are measurements for state when there is one left mover with momentum 1, and right mover with momentum 2. So in principle, there are different states, but you can put them all together now meaningfully on the same plot. But then you see they agree rel relatively well. There are lattice effects, so one should take these error bars with, with a bit of grain of salt. Also because before, people really didn't have good theory at all to think about uh, uh, this data in the, for, for the length of the strings, which we're so talking about here. Sense of those different points, you apply a different projection operator to your lattice data? Yes, right, yeah, yeah. So yeah. are they all pseudo-scalar or? Yeah, so here, no, yeah, so, yeah, so I always, so the red, red, red is always pseudo-scalar. Pseudo yeah, but this is, scale, this is scalar and, and this is spin two, right. right. So all, every right. point corresponds to different projections. Right. And it, yeah. So these are all non-perturbative effects then, basically? Or, or somehow contained in that? Effective well, data points, these are just QCD measurements. So in that sense, yeah, it's, it's fully, fully non-perturbative, right? right? And then what we're showing here, the solid lines are expansion in TLS for, for scattering amplitude. Of course, it doesn't work that well when we go here, because really for us, TLS is a true expansion parameter. So we're not surprised uh, that there are disagreements here, well, but they're not that bad. So uh, actually, there is something surprising here. It looks like this phase shift saturates exactly fine. I can discuss later. We have some thoughts why 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 that's happening, but uh, but qualitatively it looks okay. So you can, uh, you're not that surprised that expansion works relatively well. As soon as it's not asymptotic expansion, even even if parameter of the one, uh, you expect a reasonable agreement. And from here you see, yeah. So neither in spin two nor in scalar channel you see nothing interesting. It's just well, it keeps to be growing rather featureless, and you see a resonance in the in the field of scalar. Uh, so I, I, I should probably finish now. I have, well, let, let me just mention there is also data for three D young mills. For three D young mills, there is there is no sign of resonance, so it, the phase shift just seems to be growing. Uh, but however, uh, there are also measurements for what's called K strings three D. So this, this is a string you may think about as a bound state uh, of a, of two strings. So you take a Wilson line, but you put in a uh, uh, not in the fundamental representation. So what's shown here is now the uh, SU6 theory. You have three, three uh, rank three antisymmetric tensor representation. So it's a bound state of three strings. So you expect to see, well, for such bound state, you expect to see some resonances there. And actually, you, you do see there is a very nice, again, resonance which apply in this data, this technique. Which actually, yeah, so this is the data. So, uh, initial data, so it looks like quite a bit of a mess, but then if you put it all on, the, and there are two and four particle states here, so it was a bit of an art kind of to identify which ones are which, but when you do that, when you put everything on one plot, you see a very nice uh, uh, 
a resonance plot on the phase shift. Uh, so, yeah, let me skip here. Let me come to conclusions. So the conclusion is, well, so even though flux tubes studied on the lattice are not very long, well, at least some of their energies are under good theoretical control. Uh, and I think it would be interesting, now that we know there is this pseudo-scalar state there, one can perform the different, like, focused simulations now to understand the, what is the, say, what is the best operator which creates this state. So I would expect it to be something like, uh, well, roughly, so, uh, so, if you insert plucket like that, so something like roughly trace of e to the a with with insertion of f in the in the transverse plane. So that would be the, the most. And you expect it should be good if it's really. It looks like a well localized particle, so you expect there should be local operator which overlaps well with this state. So it would be to understand nature of the state. It would be interesting to uh, to do a study like this. Uh, and more generally, uh, well, I think there are good chances to explore other quantum numbers and some because people were mainly fo focused on the states which are with quantum numbers which are there for number got a string. But really, well posed, interesting question: Yeah, what is the theory on the flux tube of QCD below global uh, 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 gap? So, what, are there any other states? And uh, using this technique now, I think. Nothing prevents from doing this systematically. Uh, and finally, well, this is not unique to closed string. One can extend this to open strings, which would be now actual mesons. So if you think that dynamics of flux tubes in real world QCD is not that different from pure glue, which would be true if one third is a small number, uh, then you would expect roughly, well, you may, may, may try to make predictions that we're trying to do it for hybrid mesons. So you would expect if you have a meson, uh, with long enough strings, large enough spin, long enough strings between quarks, then here the prediction would be roughly there would be uh, resonance of these mesons corresponding to adding this particle on the wall sheet. So we, we know the mass of the particles of 750 MeV, and we know it's quantum numbers, so it would be changing the quantum numbers of a string. So uh, actually, we're yeah, looking at PDG data trying to discover actual four-dimensional particles which would correspond to these two-dimensional particles. Uh, yeah, and one last thing I wanted to say, actually, I was mainly talking here about SU3, but there's also SU5 and SU6 data, and it shows the same phenomenon, and actually the mass of this pseudo-scalar is the same in string units. It doesn't change when you go from SU3 to SU5, SU6, so actually it seems to be already a large-end phenomenon. Uh, the presence of this particle. So, because uh, probably the most interesting question to understand from microscopic point of view, from QCD point of view, why why the pseudo scalar twisted mode should be uh, the lightest mode on, on, on the bulk sheet of a string. Uh, okay, thank you. That's it. Last statement: Do you specialize the hybrid resonance spectrum? Well, because. So that would be excitation like that. So adding this particle, and it's, it's just specific excitation of a gluon field, right? So, and that's what hybrid mesons are. They're mesons which are like, that don't fit into quark models because they're on top of just, there is also excitation of glu, 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 gluon field. And here we happen to know that there is a characteristic excitation there. We, and we know it's quantum numbers and we, we know the corresponding mass scale. So it looks like we can make predictions is there any uh, sign of such states? I mean, if your generic prediction is that you should have such hybrid states, do you see any sign of them? Well, there are some non-understood states, and well, we're, we're in process, so uh, that answer, I, I don't know, yeah. But I mean, you said that because they're there on the closed thing, they should be there on the open thing, but the dynamics could be very different, I would think. I mean, no, but the, no, but the whole point here, this is a field which lives in the bulk of a string. So, yeah, so it's mo actually more tricky to do calculations for open strings. You need to take account, you need to, to, to account for boundary effects. Uh, but this particle is just a field which propagates on a, on a ball shape. So in that sense, it is, it is there, it, 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 that's independent of the boundary condition. Other questions? Okay,
Thanks, Sergey, again.